Yeah, this is a test. This is a test. Yeah, this is a test. This is a test. This is a test. It's a lecture, guys. That's not our shared Oh, are we starting? Yeah. Okay. So, welcome to class. Hi. Hi. So today we're going to talk about, um, well, at least for the next little while, we're going to talk about hydration, rest, and you voice hygiene, for the lack of a better term. So. Um, I am going to talk to you a little bit about hydration. So, um, drinking lots of water and staying hydrated is is a lot like um, upkeeping a vehicle. Like you always have to have oil in your car so it's lubricated and it all runs really, really smoothly. And water is just like that. Um, so we all know, have experienced when we have like dry mouth how that affects us, but how else do you think water, like drinking water helps our body? Helps digestion and uh, yeah. everything. Metabolism, yeah. okay. great. Yeah. Anne Marie? Helps it stay nice and spongy. Helps yes, skin. stay spongy. Circulation. Mm -hmm. Glowy skin, love that, I have that right here. What did you say? Circulation. Yes. It helps. Um, oh, it helps your heart more easily pump blood through the body. I didn't know that. That's pretty cool. Circulation. What did you say? Nails? Oh, like your nails and your. I didn't know that. That's cool. Anything else? I'm carrying nails. That's really corroborated. Um, I found an article that said it prevents cancer. It helps prevent cancer. It also helps prevent headaches. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it transports nutrients, so it keeps the cells alive and happy if we have lots of water. So, great job. Oh, it also protects our tissues and spinal cord and joints. So, all of these things, beyond just keeping our vocal folds nice and moist, it helps our body function as an opera singer, right? So, we need our joints and our tissues, and we need to digest food as not only a human, but an opera singer too. Okay, so there are two types of hydration. One is systemic hydration, so that's like a healthy fluid balance in your tissues and your whole body. And then there's also superficial hydration, which often comes as a result of systemic hydration. Superficial is just like when you feel really dry on your vocal folds and things like that. Um, you can fix both superficial and systemic hydration by um, drinking a lot of water. Now, how how many cups of water should we be drinking a day? Eight. Eight to ten. So lots of things, lots of things say eight, eight, eight ounce is eight ounce glasses of water a day. And that's and that's really easy to remember, which is why lots of people say that. But lots of more recent research has said that you should drink 0.5 to 1 ounce. This is on your sheet. This is your first thing. 0.5 to 1 ounce uh, per pound you weigh. So for example, if you weigh 150 pounds, you should be drinking about 75 ounces to 150 ounces a day. Seems like a really big range. Yep. What's the number? 0.5 to 1 ounce. <laughs> 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 um, also, oh, your body weight. what? So yes. half your body weight. Yeah. 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 Have to, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so much water. Yeah, just follow Michael's example. Also, so another thing that can affect super, excuse me. Another thing that can affect superficial hydration is your environment. We obviously live in a very humid place, but oftentimes you might have to travel to less humid places. And so what the best humidity to have, your environment should have is 30 to 40% humidity. That's another thing on your paper that you can fill in. <laughs> okay, um, 
Also, a random thing that I found that can help superficial hydration is inhaling through the nose. I mean, we know that, but I just didn't think about it a lot. And um, another thing that can help with systemic hydration, keeping your whole body hydrated, is eating wet snacks like melons or plums, applesauce, and other water-infused foods. Yeah, I never thought about eating to stay hydrated. Okay, so, blah, 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 blah. So there are lots of things that dehydrate the body. I bet you can name two of them that fill in the blanks. Alcohol. Alcohol. Alcohol and caffeine. They we're all very aware of that, um, and that it dehydrates the body. At least from what I've heard, everyone saying that we're aware of that. So, what one thing that I found that is recommended is for every glass of alcohol, you should drink a glass of water to replace the dehydration. But also, good news. I found lots of things about coffee that said actually the dehydrating function of the caffeine is outweighed by how much fluid intake is with the coffee. Hmm. So, yeah. It's not as hydrative as water, but there's more water in it. Well, yeah. Than the, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, not so, as, it's not as dehydrating as alcohol. Right? Well, no, not at all. No, that's like um, so another thing to be aware of is the kind of cold medicine you're taking when you're sick um, if, and otherwise. Like if it has an antihistamine or um, something like, yeah, if it has an antihistamine in it, you probably should be, be aware of that so you can be drinking more water and also you, you can also decide just not to take it and find something else that would be better for your hydration. Some common drugs that have antihistamines are Allegra, Benadryl, Claritin, Zyrtec, mm, Dimetane, Tavis, Chlortrimetone, and others. Oh yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yes. They're allergy drugs. Yes. Yeah. Most of them are allergy drugs. Um, also, as an opera singer, we have to travel a lot. And so, um, one thing that helps us when we to be aware of when we travel, it, like when we're in cars for a long period of time or in a plane for a long period of time, it's very dehydrating. The air conditioning is very bad for our voices. So, um, they, doctors recommend that you drink one glass per hour that you are in one of those situations, like in a car or in, um, in a plane, to replace the fluid that is escaping your body. Sounds cheap. Yeah. Oh. It's almost yes. One glass of water. Okay. Um. And that is it. That is what I have to share with you about hydration. Yay! Drink, yeah, cup, cup, drink cup, the cup, water. Cup, cup. Yeah. I think a really good point about that too. You eat a lot of water in your food, like anything that's hydrated. So when they talk about how you have to have like seventy-five ounces of water that you drink a day, you get a lot of that from eating. Too, so. Fresh fruits and vegetables. Exactly. Cactus. Eat a lot of cactus. <laughs> I didn't put that down there. Sorry. Awesome cactus. <laughs> so, we're jumping right off with one of your blanks for rest, which is kind of the, the cap for this entire section, which is the voice was not designed for unlimited use, just as the body was not designed for constant activity. So it's important to limit the number of hours that you spend every day singing and talking, as we all know. <clears throat> a lot of these things are kind of like some of the hydration things are things that you feel like you already know, but they're great reminders. So the voice itself is naturally resilient, as is the human body, um, but it requires adequate rest for recovery and maintenance. So try to maintain regular sleep patterns and avoid strenuous voice use when your body is abnormally fatigued. Um, and that's something that I think is, poses a specific challenge for all of us is that most of our life we are abnormally fatigued and we have to continue using our voice. So maintaining a regular and consistent sleep pattern, that doesn't necessarily mean going to bed at the same time, but it does mean getting the same number of hours of sleep every night. So if that's six hours for you, then that means six hours every night. If that's nine hours for you, that means nine hours every night. But how much sleep is enough sleep? I'll take a poll. Eight, 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 seven to nine, twelve. Mm. Mm. Well, 
So this was kind of a conversation that was going on among members of the National Sleep Foundation, and they said, you know, there's so much research about how much sleep we're supposed to get. So they pooled research from hundreds of studies from the last couple decades, and they distilled it all for a definitive answer regarding how many hours of sleep you actually need, and for the age categories of 18 to 25 and 26 to 64, so that's any adult 18 to 64, you need between seven and nine hours of sleep. Seven to nine hours. <clears throat> So in addition to physical rest, it's really important that we have vocal rest. And vocal stress is increasingly associated with a contemporary lifestyle, especially for those that, um, in the book Basics of Vocal Pedagogy, um, Ware calls fast lane professions. What do you think might be a fast lane profession that requires a lot of voice use? In the workplace. Teaching. Teaching. Auctioneer. Yeah, sure. Auctioneer. Auctioneer. Yeah. Love that. <laughs> a server. A server. Server. Well, Anything okay. else? Telemarketer. Anything having to do with um, stock exchange bidder. Oh yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Anything that has to do with service. So those kinds of professions pro pose a, a special risk as compared to somebody who might be a visual artist or a writer or. <coughs> a programmer, somebody who doesn't really spend a lot of time speaking to others for work. And their voices that are also at risk are those who um, work, live, or have to speak in very noisy environments, like people who work in factories, um, in areas where there's heavy vehicular traffic or a lot of construction. So, here's the next blank. You are especially at risk for vocal fatigue if you are a professional voice user or if you work or live in a noisy environment. And as we all know, it's very easy for singers to overuse their voices. We work church jobs, we sing in extra choirs, we sing everyday lessons and coachings, and we sing in the operas, and we prepare recitals, and we have all of these things going on, and that's going to continue through our lives as professional freelancers. And it's terribly easy to overextend yourself um, and sing more than is really optimal, or sing and talk more than is really optimal for the voice. Here are your next two blanks back to back. Get ready. The hectic life of a singer can present special difficulties because manifestations of psychophysical stress frequently affects delicate adjustments in the vocal mechanism. So that's a crazy thing. Stress actually manifests itself in your little doodads. Common, <laughs> common among busy singers is a general state of fatigue a constant state of fatigue, particularly in the weeks preceding a major performance, which, for anyone who's in school or a freelancer, is literally all the time. <laughs> um, so in periods of stress, or, or especially intense stress, whatever your normal is, anything that is kind of compounded on top of that, um, your immune system is at risk, leaving the body vulnerable to infection, so maintenance of your overall health during stressful times requires getting adequate rest, nutrition, and exercise to help maintain normal mucosal secretions. Um, <clears throat> there's also, aside from life stress that can affect your voice, there's the actual st stress of too much voice use. Um, and so vocal strain causing vocal fatigue can be created when one sings too low or too high, in an unnatural tessitura for your voice, too loud or too soft, with a phonation that is too breast or, or too <coughs> great, pressed or too breathy, with a misaligned body and vocal tract, with tense articulators or in the wrong register, which doesn't, wrong, I didn't like that word, but it was from one of our sources, but that means chest voice belting or falsetto, something that's not standard. Um, and when your voice is uncoordinated and muscular tensions are prevalent, the stage is set for vocal misuse. So any non-optimal use of the vocal mechanism can be tiring. Here's your next one. Excessive and strenuous voice use can directly affect vocal condition, which is something that we all know from experience and from being told a million times, but is really, really important. <clears throat> Talking or singing too much without sufficient rest or while you're sick can aggravate the vocal mechanism more than normal and lead to extra vocal fatigue. Those who do, uh, we already talked about that. Um, oh, 
So there are, there are multiple scenarios in which a singer might consider altering, reducing, or eliminating voice use altogether. These might include during the duration of a general upper respiratory tract infection or laryngitis. Um, you might choose to go on vocal rest after you experience a decline in vocal quality after prolonged use or strenuous use, or hyperfunctional use after surgery on the vocal cords. So usually common sense prevails and singers self-limit their voice use based on how much effort is required and how much discomfort you're experiencing until you're feeling well again. However, pushing through an illness and placing high demands on the voice while ill can cause laryngeal injury. So the challenge is to balance the appropriate amount of rest with some variation of a vocal fitness regimen, which is some kind of vocal exercise. Um, so for rest after a vocal fold, vocal fold surgery, for example, perhaps the most extreme example of trauma to the vocal cords, a survey of otolaryngologists resulted in the consensus that you should take between 0 and 14 days of complete voice rest, and then a, the next 0 to 24 days should be modified voice rest, which is a little bit of rest and a little bit of vocal exercise to um, strengthen the muscle. That's like after illness? That would be that specifically after a vocal fold surgery, oh. not after an illness. <clears throat> um, great. So there are vocal fatigue it's, in general means that the laryngeal intrinsic and extrinsic muscles can no longer sustain the vocal task of phonation. So I'm going to list six symptoms of vocal fatigue. You may choose any two for your worksheet. Symptoms of vocal fatigue include a decline in vocal quality, which might mean a hoarse, husky, or breathy phonation, the loss of voice altogether, the decreased ability to sustain pitch, the loss of endurance and or intensity, increased vocal effort, and throat discomfort, fatigue, or pain. So this next part I thought was really, really interesting and was a totally new idea for me. So as we know, the vocal folds are covered in this mucosal layer. Vocal fatigue itself may be muscular or mucosal. Isn't that crazy? It's crazy. <laughs> so, mu mucosal fatigue is what happens when the viscosity of the mucosal layer is increased, which results in increased vocal fold stiffness, which in turn requires more lung pressure to sustain a vibration. Wow. Um, so the, that increased viscosity results in the generation of more friction during vocal fold vibration. Um, and mucosal fatigue can sometimes respond to systemic and environmental hydration, which are some concepts that Jenny talked about. So you can combat mucosal fatigue by dealing with dehydration. And you can prevent systemic dehydration by drinking water or eating wet snacks. You can prevent environmental hydration by using humidifiers or steamers. Conversely, the other kind of fatigue, muscular fatigue, you can combat that by altering, altering voice intensity and frequency of use, take vocal naps, or cool down after intense periods of voice use. Vocal naps. Vocal naps. <laughs> Good. Great. Great. So my section is singing versus talking hygiene, but in the research that I did for this, I um, kind of was thinking that that's a little bit misleading because it made me want to take out my larynx and scrub it with a toothbrush, which is not physically possible. So I like to call it non-singing maintenance and technique, which is something that I wrote beside it in case all of you feel so inclined. Um, non and what's that non-singing maintenance and technique? So as my colleagues have discussed earlier, our holistic health has a huge part in how we sing, the quality of our singing, the duration for how long we can sing, and a longevity kind of deal. Um, so here's a little bit of information, and we can talk about some techniques that you can do as opera singers to help train your speaking technique to be optimal for our careers and for us as social human beings who use our voices constantly. Um, did you know that in any environment, your speaking voice has to be 12 decibels louder than the ambient noise around it? No. No. That's a so, in here, How much for is instance, that? Oh, no. Uh, it's go back and look. Okay. Every <laughs> times, 10 decibels is twice as loud. Times two times three decibels is twice as loud. Three decibels so, is twice as loud. Six times right. times as loud. Two times eight times. Yeah. Great. 
So obviously in a situation like this, or when you're having a conversation with someone, you know, driving over a car, those are things that don't necessarily affect you. But as people who, op as opera singers, we go into social events often. When people are speaking, especially at the same pitch level, and when there's other music happening, you are putting incredible stress on your voice. And I can say that personally, like in my own life, because my speaking voice tends to exist in a more heady kind of way just from the nature of my training and my voice type. And so when I go to like the club and I'm having fun with you guys, like I can tell the next day that I've done that because I'm basically sitting on my voice in a way that I'm not used to doing that can affect my voice for days or like weeks afterwards. So I have to okay, you don't have to come anymore. And that's not something that we think about often, you know, in our experiences. So what can you do as an opera singer to make sure that you are really tapping into your technique that you've incorporated into your lives as a singer, into the way you speak? You can find your optimal speaking range. And that sounds like something that would be intuitive for us, but it's actually not, because our American culture kind of insists that we speak in this very kind of vocal fry, like at the bottom part of our range kind of way, and that's completely not correct. So some really organic ways you can get to that. When you say mm-hmm or aha uh -huh at someone, those are very short, very efficient vocalises that are usually in the most efficient part of your voice, whether you're speaking or singing. So if you as a singer incorporate the mindset that you take while you're singing into those kinds of moments and try to use that as a more consistent level of speaking, you will find that your singing voice has more stamina by far and also you'll be able to sing for longer, and I'm not just talking about to get to the end of the recital, I'm talking about maybe in your 60s or 70s. For instance, you think about people like Jessie Norman, who like, I've made fun of her in my own life for the way she speaks, but think about her career. The, it's important to start thinking about your, your speaking voice as being a part of your instrument all the time. And that doesn't mean changing it in some kind of contrived way, but it merely means synthesizing how you speak and how you sing to more of a cohesive thing. Which also could, you know, you could suggest that that might help your singing technique anyway become more natural and more efficient. So, Jesse Norman, Juan Diego Flores, Thomas Hampson, these are some people that you can listen to and really hear some kinds of technique in the way that they speak. So, I mean, we talked about uh-huh, mm -hmm, things like that. You can test your boundaries in speaking. This is something that you can be aware of, like, all the time. You know, as animated people, performers, I mean, even today, I've heard, like, people making some sounds that maybe aren't necessarily ideal for singing. And I know that, if, you know, being, I don't know, a relatively flamboyant person, I'm always finding myself making, vo making voices that are probably detrimental. And in fact, like, on Fridays, when I would have to sing in studio class, if I'm being like particularly animated or like having really boisterous conversations with you guys, I find that I don't sing as well because I've been sitting here doing all kinds of things to my voice, taking it out of the shape that it needs to be and to sing efficiently. And so test your boundaries. What kinds of things can you do while speaking that help you sing better? And what kinds of things are you doing that are hurting you during your performances? Right. There are three kinds of non-scripted speech. Conversational, which is what, you know, Chelsea and I would have when we're having a crisis. And then there's declamatory, which is probably what, I, what you would say I'm doing with you right now. I'm using enough of my voice to project over the room, but I'm not screaming at you and you're not getting the sense that I'm yelling. There's also dramatic. So if you were to go see a Shakespearean production of Hamlet, they would be using a dramatic kind of speaking that is probably equitable to what we do when we're singing as opera singers, just because they have to speak for five hours with no microphone and be heard by everyone in the house. So it's important to explore those different levels in your own speaking, and some people are going to be more inclined to it just from their singing already. Like, for instance, Michael Hewitt. His voice is very resonant. Or Alex, someone who has, who's generally speaks in the same tessitura that they sing in, well, again, I'll use myself as an example, I don't speak where I sing. So I'm constantly finding, you know, I go out into an, a stage and say, <laughs> Oh my god, he's dead. But, but that's something that happens to me all the time, and so I'm, I'm constantly having to think about how can I support my speaking voice while I introduce myself, but not tax myself during this, you know, whatever I'm about to So, that brings us down to the literal hygiene part. Do you guys know how to wash your hands? 
Yeah. <laughs> you think you do, but you don't. <laughs> there are YouTube video tutorials on how to wash your hands. Hmm. I suggest that you go watch them because I was like embarrassingly enlightened. Did you know you're supposed to be scrubbing your hands for 30 seconds, not yes. when you get them under the water, so scrubbing them while they're covered with soap? Hmm. You don't do right? <laughs> yeah, but think about it. The next time you wash your hands, and it's a particularly interesting for people like me who tend to bite their nails. Because if you don't use proper hand washing technique, the vast majority of the bacteria that are going to give you like some kind of pathological infection live under your fingernails. So if you're not washing your hands on purpose, you're just putting it back into your mouth anyway, and you might as well just like not even bother. Mm, and so, literally. when you what you use, scientists find that when you use proper hand washing technique, you can eliminate two major colds per year and two upper respiratory infections. So, if you're someone who finds that you always get screwed at the timing of your illnesses, wash your hands. <laughs> wash your hands. <laughs> also, something that the scientists also find is particularly illuminating as to the general health for a person is their oral health. Take care of your mouth. Floss. No, I'm serious. Bleeding gums, halitosis, breath, which is bad breath, these are indications of your holistic body health. And what you put into your body is usually reflected in the way that your mouth, the, the state of your mouth. So take care of your oral hygiene and everything below it is going to be more healthy. And I'm not just talking about your pharynx and things. So, moral of the story is speak like singers. <coughs> Merge your technique with your speaking voice to simplify the way that you sing and eliminate tension and also make sure that you're using your instrument all the time even when you're not on. Also, be clean. Wash your hands. Remember that we have to sing for periods of time that are beyond what a normal person would and be respectful of that in terms of staying clean. Alright, who's next? Who finished their worksheet? Oh, I forgot. Did anyone besides our dean finish the worksheet? Hey, I did not the I don't know why I <laughs> 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 Alright class, well today our Dean, Allie, and I will be talking to you about drugs. Woo! <laughs> medication, prescribed medication, and <laughs> menstruation, menstruation, uh, something. menstruation, something. <laughs> not, not lady box? Hormones. Oh, okay. Um, and so I'm going to start it off with uh, over-the-counter medication, and before I go into anything, really, it's just really important to know that before you purchase any medication, um, it's really important to consult your doctor, which is literally on every single medication commercial you've seen, is talk to your doctor, especially if you have an ENT that you go to regularly. Um, you can consult him um, if you want to know the effects or the potential side effects of medication that you're taking on your voice, which is kind of what we're going to be talking about. Um, so, I've split over-the-counter drugs into three categories. Antihistamines, which uh, the previous group kind of talked about a little bit. Decongestants and non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, NSAIDs, is the abbreviation, which is basically just a fancy name for painkillers, fever reducers, your typical Advil, Tylenol. And um, what we find is that the biggest problem that singers can encounter with uh, both, both antihistamines and decongestants is the fact that while they do help you clean your, clear your sinuses up and really dry you out, that's exactly what the problem is. It's drying you out. So um, 
they have a lot of dehydration effects on the boys and the entire body. So again, the previous group brought it up. It's really important that while you're taking this medication for allergies or for getting rid of a cold, um, it's really important to hydrate uh, and just drink more fluids than you would normally do in a normal day. Um, <clears throat> Um, yeah, so, and then with, um, with the, the NSAIDs, um, or the, uh, the non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, um, it may be advisable to avoid aspirin, like bufferin or excedrin, um, or ibuprofen, like Advil or Motrin, because of, this is probably the most important part, of the increased risk of vocal hemorrhage, which none of us want. So what happens when you take these drugs is that it, um, it makes the blood thinner, and by coating the platelets that form the clot, basically. And that basically just increased the risk of bleeding. And so, um, it's the same with your vocal cords. They're going to have an increased risk of bleeding. So if you're using them um, strenuously, or if, basically if you're a singer and you're using them a lot, uh, they're going to have an increased risk of being hemorrhaged. So, what we can do is take Tylenol, and that's basically the takeaway message from, from this over-the-counter thing, is if you're going to buy a pain medicine to take while you're singing, um, just buy Tylenol. It has acetaminophen, which doesn't have this blood thinning effect on the voice, so all of the singers, um, all of the professional singers, like, swear by just taking Tylenol, because if you take aspirin, for instance, it can coat these platelets for up to seven days after you take it. So if you're doing any sort of singing after that, it's really dangerous, um, or it can be potentially dangerous. Uh, so yeah, and then for the, uh, the common cold, which is kind of our most frequently visited sickness of the year, what's really important is to just uh, take um, a really good medicine for it is Zycam, which is a cold um, suppressor and reducer. And it has, it's basically a zinc supplement. So all sorts of vitamin supplements are good. Um, but at the same time, um, taking fat soluble vitamins such as vitamin A, D, and E in above normal doses. So if you're trying to, you know, boost your immune system um, for a prolonged period of time, that can also have the same effect as these blood thinning NSAIDs. So it's just, be wary, and again, consult your doctor before you do anything, and Tylenol is the way to go. Okay, so moving on from over-the-counter medication to the stuff that's harder to get, um, prescription medication. I've grouped this into two groups, and the first one that we're going to go over are uh, prescriptions that you're going to get for specifically throat ailments, which are prescribed to you to fix something that's going on in your ear, nose, throat area, but may have potentially harmful side effects. And then the second part are drugs that are not prescribed to you specifically for your throat or your EMD tract, but may also have effects on your throat that you might not think about. Um, special shout out to my mother, who's a pharmacist, which is where most of the symptoms came from. Um, so the first thing we're going to look at uh, for section A is oral steroids. So the purpose of a steroid is to decrease inflammation. So you might have a steroid prescribed to you if you have really severe allergies, an autoimmune disorder, or like epiglottitis, which is when your epiglottis swells and then you basically can't breathe. Or if you have very swollen tonsils and they give you a steroid, they might give it to you in a shot or in a big pill because that's going to drastically decrease the inflammation in 24 hours, allowing you to breathe or allowing you to sort of, your body to calm down enough to give you antibiotics. Um, so the effect that a steroid would have on your vocal health is throat irritation and dryness. Um, you might get a cough. Uh, the most important thing for most of these drugs is that the dry vocal cords, cords will become more prone to injuries such as nodules. So if you're taking steroids during a time of really intense singing, you should be really, really careful because also what steroids are going to do is they're going to make you feel almost nothing. So you're going to feel like you're fine. So if you do hemorrhage, you're not going to feel it right away. Um, so, besides oral steroids, you can also get nasal steroids. Um, Nasonex, Flonase are two really common ones. And these block certain natural substances that are going to cause allergies. They help you with nasal polyps. 
Um, these are going to cause pretty much the same thing, throat irritation, dryness, um, but like with steroids, you just have to overhydrate to compensate for it because you're going to need to take them. And then the last thing, uh, antibiotics are like the standard Z-Pack. Um, what an antibiotic does is prevents further growth of bacteria, and these are going to be prescribed for pretty much any bacterial infection you get in your throat, um, laryngitis, bronchitis, pharyngitis, but also for treatments of like chlamydia and gonorrhea. So those are going to have the same, if you get prescribed uh, Zithromax for chlamydia, it's the same as getting prescribed with Zithromax for uh, bronchitis, so it's going to have the same effects, even though you're not thinking about your throat. Um, so the effects on vocal health are pretty much the same as before, dehydration, but in addition to dehydration, you also might get diarrhea, acid reflux, um, and for those, you're going to have to think about what you're eating and taking some, like, uh, what are they called, uh, probiotics, maybe to keep your stomach calmer so you don't have to experience that acid reflux. Side note with standard z pack is you could also experience the overgrowth of candida uh, fungus leading to a laryngeal thrush in your mucous membrane. So you just want to, like, keep an eye on that. It's, like, very, very rare. But if you're feeling pain in your throat after taking a Z-Pack that is pain that is not similar to that which the Z-Pack is solving, that's something you should go see an ENT about. Um, so moving on, section B. So non-throat related prescriptions. Um, the first one is <coughs> antidepressants. Now in the past like 10, 15 years, antidepressants have gotten better. The older brands of antidepressants are more likely to dry you out, um, but the new ones aren't as bad but these are gonna be prescribed for depressive disorders, anxiety disorders, obsessive compulsive disorders. Second group would be muscle relaxants uh, because these affect your skeletal muscle function, they decrease muscle tone. So if you have muscle spasms, you're given a muscle relaxant. And then diuretics, uh, so these are, they promote the production of urine to decrease your blood pressure. Um, so if heart failure, hypertension. So all three of these are gonna give you the same thing, which is dry mouth and which may result in hoarseness, a sore throat, vocal changes, and once again, your dry vocal cords will be more prone to having nodules. Um, last one would be anticoagulants, so blood thinners, and this is similar to taking ibuprofen, but these are just prescription anticoagulants. Um, now, this one is similar to ibuprofen in the sense that it's going to, again, increase your increases of vocal hemorrhage or polyp formation in response to trauma, so blood in your vocal cords is going to be thinner, so if you're if they experience trauma, they're more likely to hemorrhage, so you should be particularly cautious. Basically, what Pat says is all of these drugs, you're putting something foreign in your body that is serving a positive purpose, but you're going to be dehydrated. So when taking these drugs, you should be taking special, like extra precautions to be more hydrated. So that means drinking having Gatorade or drinking just like an excessive amount of water, steaming, making sure, and also making sure you're not singing as much because there's nothing you can do to not be dehydrated, and that shouldn't be a reason you don't take this medication because it is going to serve a purpose. So just make sure you're hydrating more. So hormones. Um, women often experience changes in this <coughs> quality around the time of their menses. And because it's such a common problem, it has its own name. Um, and it's called Lorengopathia premenstrualis. Oh. It is a vocal dysfunction which occurs in the immediate premenstrual period and is correct characterized by decreased vocal efficiency. So during the menstrual cycle, it is common for excess fluid to be present in many of the tissues of the body, including the vocal folds. And there are changes in hormonal levels of estrogen and progesterone, which is like a male um, hormone. And um, they lead to fluid retention or edema of the vocal fold tissue. And as the estrogen level declines during the period, the laryngeal tissue um, starts to absorb water and it causes your folds to swell and with the swelling that creates more mass in the vocal folds thus changing the the nature of the vibrato because there's more surface area um, possible changes in phonation include hoarseness breathiness and reduction in range particular particularly in the top voice the voice sounds very tired and has less power and flexibility. And also, like, something I found out while reading through um, Clifton Ware's book, um, there was a study that was done in the 1960s and 70s, and I don't know if it's still done this way, but European houses, opera houses, 
have something called respect days for women where you're not allowed to sing for one to three, two, three days um, during your menstrual cycle, which I think that's pretty cool. I didn't even know about that. But however, American opera houses don't have that. So what do you do when you have to sing while you're on your period? Um, uh, from Mary Beth Dame, it is best to sing gently on those days and take easy physical exercise when you can. Do not force the voice, and if a singer has severe symptoms, it is advised to abstain from performing for one to three days during that time. And also, like, um, vocal exercises can also help out while you're um, in your period as well. So birth control. There have been many concerns in the past about the consequences of oral contraceptives because they have a swelling effect. And some young women that use birth control have experienced changes leading to masculinization with deepening and roughening of vocal quality. Singers in their teens and 20s are advised to search for other means of contraceptions. However, like with the pills that are marketed today, the doses are very low, and they really just recommend that you contact a gynecologist for any type of birth control. Like the birth control that I take um, has very low dose of estrogen and progesterone, so I'm not actually having any of the effects where my voice has like a deeper quality. So really, it's just going to a trusted gynecologist and make sure that they give you like the, as a singer, the correct birth control that you need. And briefly with menopause. Um, a woman's hormonal levels of estrogen becomes depleted, which causes substantial changes in the mucous membranes of the vocal tract, in the muscles, and throughout the body. The result is usually an overall de deterioration of voice quality, including the loss of high notes and a heavier voice quality. The vocal folds might lose some of their natural elasticity, the viscosity of the lubric lubricating mucus, might change and average fundamental frequency tends to lower, lower. There are some medications for menopausal, uh, for women who are going through their menopause, but still again, that's going to your gynecologist and your um, laryngologist, is that what they're called? Laryngologist. <laughs> laryngologist and just, it's based on your, what you need to talk to them about because everyone has <coughs> different problems. Like me, I don't experience anything during my period. Others, I, I've talked to others and they say they do experience this and that, or like their throat swell. I'm like, I don't experience that. So, <laughs> <laughs> so that's why it was very interesting for me to read about this. Because I'm like, oh. Me so, neither. Yeah. No. yeah. Attendance sheet go. Do you all have it? What? The attendance thing? Yeah, I didn't want to run. Oh, I didn't get the. Well, we were presenting it and I didn't know. Who had yeah. it? Oh, wait, hold on. I hate it. Was it over here? Whoa. Oh, it's right there. Chris, Sorry. you should get at least four points back. So this you fuck me up. The name of the thing is where they put it. It's like this. Okay. You really did. Fuck me up. Do you guys think this? I know. Okay, so we're doing nice. vocal disorders. Uh, there's another person, another group going on Thursday. They're also doing vocal disorders, but it's more specifically sort of vocal injury based. Yeah. Yep. Ours is under the general umbrella of laryngitis, um, with a little bit of overlap at the very end in the lesions and masses. Mm -hmm. 
So, what is laryngitis? Um, it's a humongous umbrella term that doctors use. McCoy's definition is the medical word that indicates laryngeal inflammation, which basically means we don't necessarily know what is inflaming the larynx, but it's inflamed. Right? So there are 6,000 different things that can make a larynx inflamed, and all of the sort of subheadings that we'll be talking about during this all can fit under the umbrella of laryngitis, meaning the vocal folds are inflamed somehow, swollen. Uh, the first picture in here is an example of reflux inflammation reflux laryngitis. It doesn't necessarily mean, oh, I can't well, put my phones together. It can be very mild, even just allergies, or if you're a smoker, you have constant slight laryngitis. Or if you're dehydrated, laryngitis sicca literally just means dryness causing laryngitis. <laughs> Which is like kind of a joke, but it's on Dr. Stephanie's website, so it's a thing. So like 80% of the cases of laryngitis that we're talking about are thoroughly superficial laryngitis. So we're talking about like the more scary, specific versions of laryngitis. Oh, inflammation, just interesting idea, uh, thought. Uh, laryngitis is caused by immune response because it's a way, if, if your immune system can swell up a particular part of the body, it makes it more difficult for pathogens to get around. And since those areas are blood filled, there's a higher concentration of white blood cells in that area. So it can respond to whatever pathogens or injuries are in that inflamed area without risking further infection as much. Uh, usually laryngitis for just basic infections uh, is an upper respiratory infection that gets dripped down into the larynx. Which is why a lot of times people will get sick and not initially have vocal symptoms. And then like four or five days later they're like, oh. Uh, you want to talk about sure. So this is uh, very, just a very cursory uh, understanding of what these things are. The G, E, R, G, and L, P, R are effectively the same thing. It's our two names for what we most commonly know as acid reflux. Um, and the only difference is really the LPR is the laryngeal manifestation of GERD. So as it says here, GERD is gastroesophageal reflux disease. It's a medical condition in which acid from the stomach flows back into the esophagus through the sphincter located at the top of the stomach. When the larynx is involved, it's LPR. So, and singers are more disproportionately um, prone to LPR because we're constantly using the muscles of the abdomen, which basically facilitates the extra propulsion it need, the acid needs to get all the way up to the larynx. Since we're constantly breathing and using those muscles down there, the acid can flow more freely higher up in the mechanism and causing a laryngeal manifestation of the laryngitis, the inflammation of the actual cords and laryngeal mechanism itself, rather than just esophageal heartburn, which most non-singer people will experience from reflux. When people say, oh, I have heartburn, they usually feel it in the lower part of their neck and in, in, in their chest area. But when we, we might not even <laughs> ever think of having heartburn because to us, you know, the most horrible feeling ever is not being able to sing. So we might feel like a horrible heartburn of a normal person, but not even thinking about it because we can't sing. So we're like, I'm afflicted with this horrible thing. Anyway, so that's we, the basic right now. We might not even have, there are plenty of people in this room who probably don't have chronic reflux, but experience reflux from time to time. And you might not even be aware of it. I am, for example, today, because, and this is the other major risk factor for singers in reflux, is after performances, we have a tendency to eat way too late. In the <laughs> right. Um, so I was, ate some food at like midnight last night, finishing this handout, um, and then went immediately <laughs> to bed. So that's a risk factor for reflux where I don't normally have chronic reflux, you know? We'll get more to treatment of the various types of laryngitis later, but it's important to note that GERD and LPR are the, is the, it's the only laryngitis thing, form of laryngitis, where a lifestyle change other than just more conscientious voice use can seriously affect um, how the course of the affliction. It can really help 
what's going on with your laryngitis just by sleeping better and eating better and at the right times. Um, so yeah, important to know. And, and Jack, if you want to just get rid of reflux for the rest of your life, doctors have developed a surgery to prevent acid reflux where they take the top of your stomach and cinch it around the bottom of your esophagus to narrow the tube. It's basically like really? gastric bypass, but for your esophagus. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds awesome. It's pretty <laughs> nuclear. It's pretty nuclear, but it doesn't. All right, fungal laryngitis is when there's a fungus infection that gets on the cords, and uh, it leads to laryngitis. So the most common of these fungus that can grow is the yeast fungus called candida. Um, we all, most of us would have this in our body um, just all the time, just small amounts in the body. This particular one that develops in the mouth and the throat is called um, thrush, is the, the little slang term for it. And it's the same fungus that women get when they have yeast infections, oh. but it's on your cords. Oh. <laughs> 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 but guys can get it too. Uh, okay, so people who are more, it's, it's not a very common thing at all. It's mostly people with really low and weak immune systems, so people living with HIV and AIDS, diabetes, people um, with asthma that use inhalers that have uh, steroid medication, cancer patients specifically going through chemo, um, people with really bad acid reflux, and people who take lots of antibiotics. Those are people who are mo more susceptible to getting it. So here's a picture. Of normal versus the yeasty and yummy. <laughs> <laughs> so that's kind of what it looks like. Can't be that. Um, and then here's a little video of someone. This is a singer. He's like 30 year old singer, I think it said. Um, and he has fungal laryngitis. Ew, I don't want to look at that. Are you taking me out of there now? So it's kind of like at the top, those little white spots. Oh, yeah. So in his case, the, the fungus actually kept going down to his esophagus, Ew. which is, if you don't treat it in time, it'll just keep spreading. So, okay, that's um, another weird and kind of cool thing, because it just keeps on growing if you don't treat it, um, you, can, you can get to the point where you have sort of partial airway occlusions of candida. Uh, my best friend's father had uh, a big occlusion in his larynx. And he went to uh, an ENT in Chicago that wasn't, Dr. Bastion's the big one in Chicago who's really good, but someone who wasn't quite as good. And it's easy to diagnose candida if you have a, fung a fungal culture. You just scrape a little bit off and test it like you would with a flu virus. <clears throat> but if you don't do that, it looks pretty funky. The second picture in the handout is just weird sort of bulbous masses. Um, and he said, oh, it's a candida infection. And so they put him on antifungals without doing a culture. And he, it wasn't getting better for several weeks, and he finally went to Dr. Bastion. And he was like, did he ever do a culture? And they were like, no. And he was like, it's actually throat cancer. <laughs> uh, so the weird thing about candida is that it can take any shape. Um, it can be sort of that just like light white stuff, or it can be like sort of crusty masses on top of it. And it's... But because it's so, yeah, because it's not very common, I think it gets misdiagnosed a lot. Mm -hmm. So that's why. Okay. So treatment, um, you can take, there's certain like dissolving pills and mouthwashes that can, um, if you gargle and stuff, it could do that. But yeah, there you go. If, in case you, any of you have fungal laryngitis. So. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, so the next thing is steroid Quit inhaling mushrooms. Is that how you say it? Yeah. Uh, so this is um, due to taking steroid medication, wh whatever it may be, mostly it's for people who take um, inhalers with it. Uh, the steroids can just 
um, affect your chords. And the myasthenia means weakness, BT does. Um, so chronic exposure to these steroids cause your vocal cords to thin, the muscles to thin, and that leads to chronic laryngitis. And obviously your sound is affected by it. And if you go off the inhaler, you're taking inhalers and you notice the change, it'll take weeks though to recover from it, so it's not going to be like a, like a right away, go away thing. But, yeah. Okay, so muscle tension dysphoria. This is um, a bad one. According to what? I said this is a bad one. Yeah, this is really bad. Um, the McCoy definition says it's a condition in which we overuse the intrinsic and extrinsic muscles of our larynx that results in hoarseness, aka laryngitis, vocal fatigue, and pain when speaking or singing. Um, and just to like a, just to like further elaborate on that, um, it's it's a change in the sound or the feel of your voice because you've been using the muscles too much, and it prevents the voice from working efficiently because the pattern of muscle use is just, it's completely off because it's all swollen and the, it affects the vocal cords. Um, and stuff like stress and, I mean, so much can cause, so many different factors, psychological, emotional, uh, physical, all these things, they kind of, it can happen to anyone. Um, and this is just further elaborating on, on what, what, it, what it's all about. Um, just, it's such an imbalance of the muscle usage um, and it, it, you know, it, it, the larynx becomes um, improperly placed, and it just creates it just so much tension and tension and tension. And you just the only way to make it stop is really to just rest your rest your muscles, rest your voice, and stuff. Like the the third picture in the handout underneath that section is really hard to see the folds because the extrinsic muscles of the larynx are so engaged and so tense. Yeah that the larynx is constricted, and so they can't get the flexible scope into the tube. Yeah. So common symptoms, you know, uh, would be a rough, gravelly voice, breathy, strained, um, cuts off or breaks off, um, gives out, becomes weaker quickly, um, pitch that is too high or too low, difficult, difficulty singing, you know, your good notes, um, <laughs> pain or tension in the throat uh, when you're speaking or singing, and feeling like you get tired very easily, and you know, stuff like that. Um, and really, the uh, you know, there's there's all these different treatments for it because there's all these different reasons why we can get it. But um, you know, people will say voice therapy, um, getting a massage, acupuncture, going to see a psychologist, um, you know, whatever physical therapy that needs to be done, and in most severe cases, you can actually get an injection um, so that you can just like calm those muscles down. Um, a lot of people will say that it takes, um, you know, it's not just this we should be focusing on when you have muscle tension dysphonia, you should be uh, focusing on your whole body to try and, to try and get the muscles to relax, because it's really, it's really just, you know, just like we talked about in class, like the throat is an anaconda, it's just like, it's already kind of squeezing, and then it just becomes even worse with muscle tension dysphonia. Um, this was just, I know you can't really see the chart very well, but I thought it was a cool chart that I found. Um, just some factors that contribute to muscle tension dysphonia, such as um, muscular imbalances. It talks about, you know, the intrinsic and extrinsic uh, neck muscles, and then it even talks about, like, the scalene and the diaphragm, uh, your transversus abdominis and interior neck. Like, it, there's so much more involved with it than just this one little section of your, of your throat. Um, and uh, what happens, what can happen is, as you keep developing this dysphonia, or, you know, um, you get, you know, you have a bad posture, um, you know, decreased thoracic rotation, like all these things start changing. Um, the decreased buccal opening, so you just like you can't really um, do anything that you used to do very easily when it comes to phonation and speaking, and even your your posture starts to freak out a little bit. So it, all these things contribute to each other, and um, a lot of the times people would associate it happened from stress and anxiety. So it just yeah, like when you when you put your body through psychological trauma, it it, it just it tenses up and and it really affects the whole mechanism. Um, this is this is a polyp. 
Or no, this is muscle tendon dystonia. I am so sorry. You can see it's like just gross and misplaced and just doesn't look good. Can't even get done. Yeah, it's all it's all tight, and gross. Um, uh, okay, so lesions and masses. Um, a great term for this is a vocal cord lesion. Um, refers to a group of benign abnormal growths within or along the covering of the vocal cord. Vocal cord lesions are one of the most common causes of voice problems and are generally seen in three forms. Nodules, polyps, and cysts. So knowledge, nodules are calluses on the vocal fold and they're two little gross things that face each other and press a, you know, rub against each other when you sing. And they can, they're actually not as bad as the other ones because they can diminish over time if you like, kind of like shave them down by not really singing all that much and like, you know, t doing the right proper, you can even like, sing on it if you like if you do it right you can like really shave them down and go back to normal polyps though are really shitty or <laughs> polyps are really bad <laughs> um, because there's, there's it's this gross little ball on one side of your vocal vocal fold and um there's really nothing you can't like you can't like get that thing to go down like it needs to like you need lots of time to you know process how you're going to make this thing go away. Um, and then the cysts, that's just like a gross mass of tissue contained within a membrane on your cord. So that's even, I mean, those two are just, those are just awful. Nodules actually aren't as, aren't as bad of a case. Does anyone here have soprano pads? Has any anterior told I was just about them? to ask what that is. I've like heard oh, of them, but I can't remember. Uh, soprano pads are in the same location on the fold as nodules are. And it's the same situation in that they're, um, they're two of them one on each fold in the same place, uh, which is about two-thirds of the way back on the vocal folds. Um, and they're sensitive to the same frequencies as, uh, as nodules are, which is about C above middle C, where they're most sensitive. Uh, and sopranos tend to develop them typically like lyric, full lyric sopranos, like somewhat bigger uh, soprano voices, who, um, and they're little tiny um, convex divots in the vocal folds that uh, ENTs don't really understand why they come about, specifically in sopranos. But, um, and they don't seem to affect the sound. It doesn't <laughs> seem to affect chord induction. But they look like pre-nodules. Yeah. Um, so. Can you feel them, or does it hurt? Or uh, apparently not. I mean, I'm not a soprano, so I don't have them. But, um, Apparently, they're, they're, they don't seem to have any effect. There are lots of famous sopranos, Renee Fleming, who have soprano pads. I was told by my ENT that it's a super natural thing that happens a lot and isn't damaging or like prone, like doesn't make you more prone to vocal damage. It's just right. because of the natural use of your. But a really stupid ENT could look at them and say, oh, these are pre nodules. Yeah. yeah. You know? But anyway, so um, the symptoms for lesions and masses are very similar to uh, dysphonia. Um, your voice is tired, you're having trouble doing things the way you normally do when it comes to singing and speaking, like, you know, it'll break in sentences or break in a passage. You know, hoarse and rough quality, throat clearing, all these things kind of, yeah, they're kind of similar in their, in their symptoms. Um, here's a polyp. See, it's like this gross oh. bubble on one side of the fold, oh, this is which makes it oh. not a nodule, and it's huge. Um, oh my god! Yeah. That's a big one. See how the, the cords never fully close directly yeah. around it? Yeah. It's really bad. So that's a polyp. These are nodules. See, they're, they're two little bumps on both sides. It doesn't look as bad as the polyp. They're actually not that, it's not that big, I don't think. But again, it disrupts the mucosal wave, yeah. right? So certain pitches will be more sensitive to it than others. All right, enough of that. So all of those little daddies <gasps> were? No, it's just two, could you play it again? It's just the two in the middle. The little convex spots. It looks like there are others at the bottom. Oh, yeah, I think that would just be mucus. I think it's just. Yeah, yeah. Well, now it's the two little divots in the middle. Right there. 
Alright, thanks for going back. Yep, yep. And this is a cyst, which is like that gross mass. And that's actually some edema on there, too. Oh! Oh! oh. oh. This is the one, So that, this, that would be the first one to call up. So, because you don't get a full vocal fold um, closure with particularly pops and cysts, how is that going to manifest itself in sound? It's going to be breathy and hoarse. Air is going to escape. They're not going to be able to make phrases, right? Yeah. If speak. Especially yeah, if speak. Right. Yeah, and just um, same thing with, you know, with dysphonia. You know, you have to, you know, go to a voice therapist, you know, maybe even get injections. Um, and it's the same thing when you have these lesions or masses, um, and masses, you know, voice rest, voice therapy. Um, sometimes you can get, you, if it's so bad, you have to get phono microsurgery, which involves all these little micro tools to tr treat the, the gross things on your cords. And there we go. Oh yeah, so all of this is to say that almost all of these disorders, uh, with the possible exception of like polyps and cysts, are treatable purely with voice rest. But I think all of you guys probably already know for yourselves how hard, honest to God, voice rest is. Even, even just a day of really no voice use is like very challenging, especially for people who have their ego tied up with their voice use. You know, just, raise AKA singers. Raise your hand. <laughs> AKA singers. Right? So, and for a lot of these, like for nodules, um, you're talking about four to six weeks of voice rest to, to have them go away. But if you really commit to that, more nuclear options are usually not necessary. Um, and also just preventing misuse because you can have them recur. Yeah. Also, I wish. So. Right. We, we already talked about it in actually also the other two presentations a lot, so we're not going to belabor the point. There's like a whole slew of ways you can treat it, but includes the medications. Always basically just go to your doctor. Voice rest and hydration are like number one, and then whatever your doctor decides, you can trust your doctor, go with that. It's, surgery is usually like the very, 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 very last, 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 last thing. Usually it is lifestyle change, diet change, whatever, in addition to voice rest and hydration. Is it 1040? Almost. Yes. Yeah. It is 1040? Almost. Okay. I oh, there's just one thing that... Do you guys want to meet like a slightly older, even gayer Richard Beto? Richard Beto? Yeah. Oh, it's incredible. Um, Dr. Bastion is like the big... Oh, bye, Alex. Um, uh, Is it true that vocal nodes are, or women are more susceptible to getting them? Somewhat more, but it's possible for men to get them. I think there's also a group what? that's doing that next yeah. class, so yes. you'll, like, learn, you'll learn all about that. Yeah, can we guys think about all of our stuff? Yeah, there's some, there's some overlap with it. Or else we will have nothing. You will. Nadia, do you want to correct some information? You're welcome to do so. Okay. These are, uh, so this is Dr. Bastian, and he's going to talk about checks for uh, inflammation on the vocal folds, and he's got two particular tests, but I think one of them is a little wrong. So, like, just listen to the well, first one. Well, you can a lot of different uh, swelling checks, but we have found two seem to be sufficient, and let me tell you what they are. We use the first phrase of happy birthday, and we often change the words almost to happy birthday do you. We're moving the voice of the Very connected. And it goes like this. This is actually really good. Just the first phrase, not the whole song. So that includes high and soft. Then the second check is the staccato. It's that one targets not just high and soft, but also a lot of onsets. Now, each of these two checks is repeated semitone by semitone to find what we call your initial mucosal ceiling. So let me demonstrate with the happy birthday. You might do... And then at a certain point, 
is going to kind of resist a little. So I'll mimic what that would sound like. See how it doesn't want to happen? So do you guys see how this might be a challenge or, or not always... 100% effective for men in particular? Well, I get that, but like, what's the point? Setup? Yeah, but what's the point of, what's, what is he, what is this? He's, he's say? checking for, to check for uh, laryngeal swelling. Yeah, but there's, he said that it happens at a certain point. What's relevant about that point? So that would be my initial mucosal ceiling. So write that pitch down, and you know that's where your, your mucosal wants to, to not cross you. So his, his point is that when you're at 100% health, there's going to be a ceiling. And if that ceiling has lowered when you go into the doctor, then you're, you're likely experiencing some amount of swelling. The one pitfall for that with men who are currently in the process of training their voice is that our cricothyroid muscles often become weaker as we dwell in chest voice. So that ceiling might go down even when, situations, when the situation isn't swelling until you've gotten to sort of, you know, you're a 35-year-old professional opera singer, and then it's probably consistent. Mm -hmm. Just, you know. Cool. Anyway. Okay. Good job, guys. Thanks. Okay, so I know there's some overlap with the presentation that's going to happen on Thursday, but we'll just talk more about it, and I'm sure you have different videos and stuff. Can I see Good job, guys. Yeah. One second.